everyone is working on with the future practicum. Um, we will just be dressing in. He's going to cut long wire strands and put you like smooth. And we're going to be like dancing to cars in the park. So if you guys can do that, this is just water. This is the bow just done with it. You can just bring the binder here. And then later when it's time to present him, we'll do a little presentation and just like a little um, thank you for being our today. Mementos. <laughs> And then the students will be the A of the I don't think it's the gold wire. It's just some girls, girls foils that you can like <laughs> use in the <laughs> class. Like nothing too special. <laughs> but for okay. my kids who are in kindergarten. I, <laughs> trust me, it, this is all a craft project uh, uh, waiting at any moment. And then um, our students, the ASTE students, will be on the perimeter of the room for you to acknowledge uh -huh. early, and then they'll be ready to ask questions, and we'll have microphones for students to just stand up. But if I don't say all the words, Now and not yeah. later. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome um, everybody to the Civil and Environmental um, Engineering Distinguished Lecture. I'm Fiona Doyle. I'm the Executive Associate Dean in the College of Engineering. And um, Dean Sastry and I are very excited to be hosting today's program with our very special speaker, Dr. Wayne Clough, who's the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. Before we get started on what I know is going to be um, a wonderful talk, I'd like to give a very special welcome to our Dean Society members who are here with us today, um, as well as members of Civil and Environmental Engineering's Academy of Distinguished Alumni. Later this evening, the Academy will gather to induct the class of 2014, um, which is an extremely exciting occasion. So I'd like to welcome all of our guests and thank you from the heart for your very special support for Berkeley Engineering. And on the subject of thanks, um, in terms of who's doing the hard work, I'd like to also acknowledge our student sponsors who are here. Um, the, the, um, today, helping out with this event is the Berkeley chapter of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And our civil engineering um, department has some very, very vibrant and active um, student groups. So I'm very grateful to um, this particular one for their help with this lecture. So by way of background, in 2013, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering revived a tradition of having a semi-annual lecture and inviting a distinguished um, faculty member or alumnus to speak before the campus community. And our guest today, Wayne Clough, exemplifies this vision. Dr. Clough, uh, um, and you'll hear more about him in a minute or two, he's one of our own. He received his PhD here before going on to an accomplished career in research, education, and public service. Um, to such an extent that 10 years ago, in 2004, we were honored to present him with the college's Distinguished Engineering Alumni Award. Today's event is presented with generous support from the Warren A. and Marjorie C. Minna Endowment. Several years ago, the Minna's established the Minna Endowment for Engineering Ethics and Professional Responsibility, and clearly the topic of today's talk falls very squarely within that realm. Um, the um, Minna Endowment supports the college in our mission to teach our students about ethics and social responsibility and to spark conversations and critical thinking on ethical issues that face engineering students as well as researchers and practitioners. So this lecture is a result of their generosity and we're very grateful to the Minas for their support. At this point, it's my pleasure to invite my colleague, Professor Nick Sitter, to the stage to introduce our guest speaker. Professor Sitter. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure and great honor to be here to introduce uh, Dr. Wayne Clough to you. Um, he's a Georgia native, uh, did, received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Georgia Tech, um, master's degree from Georgia Tech, and then uh, became one of our own by receiving PhD in civil engineering from University of California at Berkeley in 1969. Um, he has had a truly amazing career as an engineer and as an educator. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 1990. Uh, he received the National Academy of Engineering Bucher Award uh, for his efforts in public policy. Uh, he has nice nine national awards from ASCE. Uh, he was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2010 serves on its Commission on Future of Humanities and Social Sciences. And of course, as an engineer, it's a very special honor to become secretary of the Smithsonian, which uh, he has uh, uh, led uh, with tremendous accomplishment. Um, he has 10 honorary doctorates from various universities. Uh, he has Emory University President's Medal and uh, uh, various uh, Lifetime of Achievement Awards from American Society of Civil Engineers. I could go on uh, l with all this laudatory stuff. What I'd like to do more is talk about him as an educator. Um, 
As an educator, he's one of the foremost leaders in, in the country as far as, uh, as any measure can be applied. Before he became the 10th president of uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology and the first alumnus to be the president of Georgia Tech, he had a distinguished teaching career at Duke, Stanford, Virginia Tech, and University of Washington. Under his leadership in 1999, Georgia Tech received the Hesburger, Hesburg Award as the nation's top, which is the nation's top recognition for support of undergraduate teaching and learning. And as an honor that's rarely given in one's lifetime, uh, Georgia Tech opened the uh, G. Wayne Clough Undergraduate Learning Commons uh, to honor his commitment to teaching. Um, having been one of his students, uh, I can attest that he was always and is an inspiring teacher to a generation of students, uh, mentor to his junior colleagues and faculty, and a visionary academic uh, leader and administrator. So it's with a great pleasure, I introduce Dr. G. Wayne Clough to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. And thank all of you for being here. And thank ASCE and the students for helping sponsor this event. Uh, and to the dean for being here and taking time out of your busy schedule and members of the civil engineering faculty and lots of friends. And I'll, I'll avoid using the word old friends for now, but just to say I've known them a long time. Uh, Nick, of course, was one of my premier students and obviously has shown that in his distinguished career. And as like you all know Nick, he is a meticulous person, and he likes things to sort of work in the right way. And I'll just tell you one story about Nick. When, <laughs> <laughs> when they had a big earthquake in Guatemala in 1977, it was a great opportunity for geotechnical engineers because it was an unusual set of geologic and soil formation, and particularly a volcanic ash formation that somehow adhered together with very light cementation but could stand in very steep slopes. And so we visited Guatemala, and, and came back and got some research funding to go down and study that formation. So the job for Nick was, after I left and I was back here just doing my usual stuff, was to get some samples of these things with very little support otherwise, just a, you know, a, some digging tool basically. And so Nick found it to be particularly difficult because every time he would get one of these samples cut apart, it would break apart. I have the picture, Nick, showing you. <laughs> <Clicking it. laughs> so, he calls me up and he says, Dr. Clough, he says, I finally got four samples and I'm going to bring them back. I just have to go through a special procedure at the airport because I'm bringing soil in. And I said, okay, well, I don't know much about that, but uh, go ahead and see how it works. And so uh, Nick shows up on campus and he's got this look. And I said, what happened? He said, well, he said, when I came in, there was a crack open into part of the container and the federal agent looked in there and he saw white powder. And he started stabbing the box with his bro, <laughs> thinking it was cocaine, of course. And <laughs> but Nick managed to get out of the clutches of the, of the agents and, and bring back. So, uh, but it was fun. Always working with Nick was, was, was a lot of fun. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you a little bit about the story that I'm going to embark on here. Because this really is a journey, and I'll hopefully take you through this journey in a way that will keep you interested and yet inform you as well. It really started, I think we're all interested in the subject of climate change and whether or not it's happening or not and how it's happening and what's triggered it and what it all means. And I think I was in that position and I was asked to chair uh, a, a committee for the National Academies uh, for the Katrina reconstruction. And so we were going to, in essence, oversee or provide an oversight to the, uh, to, to the Corps of Engineers and all the groups they had working for them and the other groups that were working there. And we heard testimony from over the course of probably two years from all of those groups as well as citizens of New Orleans. And I realized at one point that we were going to be investing 13 to $15 billion of, of, of taxpayer money into this hurricane system, a protection system. And so I asked the question, how long do we want it to be viable? How long do we want it to be viable? And everybody in this room can answer that question for themselves. If you spent $15 billion of taxpayer money, how long would you want that product to be viable? Most people will say at least 100 years, at least 100 years. Now that immediately poses an interesting question because for one thing you have to do, simple terms, is how high are the levees gonna be? How high are the levees gonna be to give protection to New Orleans in the future? 
And that comes back to climate change. And we fortunately had two climate change experts on our panel. Because they said immediately, well, everyone agrees you're going to have two and a half feet of sea level rise in 100 years, two and a half feet. And we looked at other experts and talked to them, and they, some said eight feet in 100 years. That was amazing. It was amazing. And I realized, we also realized that the system was already at risk because nine inches of sea level increase had occurred when those systems were built. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Some people will say, if you spend that much money, it should be 200 years. Well, where will the sea level be in 200 years? Many people will say it will be at least 10, if not 15 feet higher than it is today. So that's a big ticket item because it turned out the United States government could not afford to protect the system against such a condition. It's amazing when you think about it. It's amazing what's happening when you think about it. So it's an engineering question. And I, w I left with that stuck in my head for a couple of years. And then I was lucky enough to become secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, the greatest institution in all the world of its kind. Nothing like it in the world. You own it because about 60% of the funds come from taxpayer dollars. And it's an amazing institution. It does history, art, culture, and science in ways hardly anybody else does it. And as I began to learn more and more about the Smithsonian and what it does, particularly talking to their scientists, they have 500 PhD scientists. I would find many of them talking about phenomena they were observing and realize it was related to climate change. And they would say, of course it's related to climate change. These things are changing because of climate change. And as I went around the Smithsonian, I could see these different lenses opening up into the subject. And I thought, this is an interesting way to look at climate change because it allows you to see that there's a much bigger context for it than the way I was looking at it before. In addition, it made it interesting to me because the way you can look at climate change through the Smithsonian science is it's an interesting prospect because it's about natural behavior. It's about natural system behavior. And so I want to talk about that in a sense as we go through this talk. So this talk has two parts. The first part is about the Smithsonian view on, science, on climate change. And realize we're not like NOAA. We're not studying climate change for climate change itself. We're studying systems. And in the process of studying systems, we see climate change effects. And then at that the point when we get through with that, I'm going to stop and turn it into a talk about engineering and how we need to think about climate change and why uh, in regards to our designs in the future. So let's go to the next slide. Next slide. Well, I think our, you know, when you think about climate change, one of the things we know, there are some people who, quote, don't believe in it. <laughs> Fact is, climate changes all the time and always has. Uh, there are people who don't believe humans have anything to do with it. Well, that's a point of view that you might have. But what I'm sensing now, since I've been at this for a long enough period of time thinking about it, is that we're sort of at a tipping point. More and more people are talking about it. More and more people are recognizing the signs because they're getting to be more obvious. The Defense Department is talking about it. They didn't used to talk about it, but they talk about it today, and I'll talk about why that's true in a minute. The Agriculture Department talks about it. A lot of people are talking about it today. You can't avoid it, if you will. And, of course, the UN had their summit conference recently in 2014, and 300,000 people marched in, the streets, marched in the streets of New York. That's never happened before. To bring to the fore this topic of climate change and what might, it might mean for civilization in the future. So we may be at a tipping point in public understanding of the issue. Maybe not. Let's see. Next slide. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about climate change from these different perspectives of the Smithsonian. What we do on land, we have the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institution, which you see here. We have 400 research scientists that work out of Panama and all over the world on tropical research issues. Uh, we do a lot of work in the oceans, and I'll talk a little bit about our oceans research, our reef research, and our species studies and so forth, and endangered species studies. And we run the world's largest astrophysical observatory. Most people don't realize that. And we have observatories all over the world that we operate. We run satellites for NASA. Now, in 2017, we'll launch a satellite called TEMPO. It will be the first observatory in space to look back at Earth and will give us hourly readings on pollution indices in North America. We've never had that before. It's going to be a very powerful tool. I can't tell you anything about it other than that because we haven't launched it yet. So I really won't talk about that today, but just to indicate that that's coming uh, soon. Next slide. What I want to do is I want to go back to what I consider sort of a point where you can say there's a beginning. Something called, well, the Eocene. That's about 55 million years ago. So you had the Paleocene and then the Eocene. And in between, something unusual happened. And scientists call this the Paleo-Eocene Thermal Maximum. It was an unusual period. And 
Scientists tell us that this could be an analog to what might happen today as we look at what's going on today. For one reason, the continents were pretty much in the same place that they are today. So that's a sort of a given and, and a fixed kind of situation. Another thing that happened was, even though it was relatively warm to begin with, this was a period when an enormous amount of carbon was vented into the air very quickly. And so it's a subject that's of very strong interest to us because right now we have a very strong increase in carbon in the atmosphere. And we're not sure because we don't know how our systems really respond, what will go on. But we know that there's a tremendous period of warming as a result of this over a relatively short period of time. Carbon levels were over 1,000 parts per million. Well, we are now up to 400 parts per million in the Earth today and headed upwards. So we're not there yet, but that's where they were. There was a dis dissolution of deep ocean chalk, and I'm going to explain that in just a minute. It was an unusual condition. And the duration was about 200,000 years, but it really lasted much longer than that. That was the, the pedum lasted about 200,000 years. In addition, there were no continental ice caps because everything melted. So sea levels were about 250 to 300 feet higher than they are today. It was a very unusual period. And we would be concerned if sea level was higher like that. So let's go to the next slide. This is important. You've seen numbers. This is what it looks like. In the Pedum, in the northern Canada Arctic, which looks like this today, it looked like this. I like this picture because I grew up in this country. I grew up in South Georgia near the Oaks Finocchi Swamp. I know what this looks like, but I've traveled up here, and it's hard to imagine how this goes to this, but it did. The world changed dramatically as a result of this event. Next slide. Ocean levels were up, as I mentioned, and they were up in this way. You can look at it this way. Look at this North America as it looked at that time about 50 million years ago or so. And one of the things you learn very quickly when you start looking into this subject is there are winners and there are losers. When climate changes, there are sometimes winners, but there are also losers. Now, the most obvious loser in this picture is Florida. <laughs> underwater, right? But also Washington, D.C. is underwater. New York City is underwater. The whole East Coast is underwater. The winner is my hometown of Douglas, Georgia, because it's right here. Douglas, Georgia has beachfront property. <laughs> so there are always winners and there are always losers. Out here on the West Coast, guess what? San Francisco and Los Angeles will be underwater. This is big stuff and it's coming. Now it takes a long time for these things to happen, but not that long if they happen quicker than we think. So let's go to the next slide. What do we mean by dissolution of the deep ocean chalk? Well, what was happening, there was so much carbon in the air. When that carbon com comes in, CO2 comes in contact with the ocean surface waters, it changes into carbonic acid. And the oceans acidified. And the oceans acidified so much that shellfish could no longer make shells. So you couldn't have oysters because they didn't have shells. Is there anything like that happening today? The answer is yes. There was an article in the New York Times about three weeks ago. Oyster growers in Puget Sound are having trouble with their oysters because of acidification of the Puget Sound. A sign that something's going on in the natural system that we should be concerned about. Because when this happened, there were no shellfish in the ocean for a long period of time. These are shellfish, this is clay. They didn't exist. So natural systems changed dramatically as a result of this acidification. Next slide. The Smithsonian is involved in this question thanks to this gentleman over here, Scott Wing, and his colleagues from University of Colorado and Northwestern and Florida. Scott is a paleobotanist, and he talked to these marine folks, and he said, if that happened in the ocean, it must have happened on land. And he said, but I remember a period when I went with my father to Worland, Wyoming, and I saw incised valleys in the big basin uh, uh, sediments that are there under the, under the out uh, of the mountains that are there, big basin mountains. And because they were, they were incised over time as they rose there, you have about 60 million years of sediments exposed. And he said, I'm gonna look for evidence from paleobotany fossils that might show something similar to what the marine folks are seeing. And that's where I'm standing. This is one of these incised valleys. And it turned out this so-called big red bed is the source of these fossils. And that's what you see. And I had a chance, that's, those are my hands actually, to actually open my own fossils. I think they made sure that when I opened one, it was actually a fossil, <laughs> but it worked. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 
So here we are in this period of time, and Wyoming is a very hot place. It has unusual insects compared to what it has today. The important thing Scott and his colleagues were able to do, you know when you do work in the field, that if you can di differentiate things that are millions of years apart, you're doing pretty good. He was able to differentiate what was going on over 5,000 year intervals. And what he was able to show was that different sources of carbon have different signatures. And so what they understand the pedum got started was either meteorite impact and or, and or volcanic eruptions that got it started. But the next thing that happened was the tundra melted and all that vegetative matter gave off methane and carbon. And the next thing that happened, the carbon imbalance was so great the ocean began to give up its enormous carbon capacity. So what you learn from this exercise is that global warming doesn't happen in a linear fashion. It's pulses, it's pulses of things. And the question is, are we on riding on one of these pulses? So we learn from that, winners and losers, and we learn pulses, it's not a linear thing. Next slide. I have a friend who does paleontological work and has in Kenya for 35 years, Rick Potts. And Rick noted that in the, the Rift Valley where he was working, that there was a savanna, and he realized that off and on in past years, it, in many past years, it had been a, a, a lake. And this lake had come and had gone, come and had gone. And why it had come and gone was because of climate change. And he always wondered why certain hominoid species went extinct. And so he asked the question, if I could actually drill into this area, and I could actually decipher what I saw in the ground and in the, in the drill cores, could I tell something about climate change? And indeed he could. Next slide. So this is Rick. He's a fascinating man and all of his colleagues working, looking at these different layers in here that represent different changes in the climate. The next thing he did was to correlate it to all human discoveries of our previous ancestors, the hominoid species, that have existed about six billion years or so to today. And, and uh, next slide. It's a little hard to follow this slide, but I'm gonna just interpret it for you real quickly. So this is five million years back to zero. That's where we are today. Stages of most prolonged high climate variability, these white areas are where you have high climate variability. These are the different species that have come and gone, and these actually are the names that we won't get into in detail here. But what you find, and what Rick showed was, these species lines often stop in a period of high climate variability. You have to be adaptable or you don't make it through a period of high climate variability. So who are we? We are the last of this species. We are Homo sapiens. We are only 200,000 years old. All others before us have gone extinct. So are we vulnerable or not? We have big brains, but we certainly have built a lot of infrastructure that's vulnerable because it doesn't move. In the old days it did. So let's keep that in mind, move to the next slide. That's Neanderthal. This is Homo versus Neanderthal. Neanderthals died out in part because they were competing against homo, uh, homo sapiens, but also because Neanderthals' bodies were adapted to cold climates, and when it got warm, they couldn't adapt, and they died, and they went extinct. Next slide. This goes to another area of work by the Smithsonian I'll just mention because it's interesting. We're very good at long-term observations, and so about 50 years ago, we started making observations of forest with people around the world in a very standardized manner so you could observe what was happening in forest. And you can see the dots around here, 60 plots in 24 countries. There are two out here, one operated by the University of Washington, one by Santa Cruz. Now, then over time, what we've seen with climate change, with carbon changing, is, is forests are changing, and they're changing quickly. And what we see is the losers winners process. Some species thrive on high carbon, some die. And so the forests that we see today and see around us are changing as a result of carbon. That's what the observation is saying. We asked ourselves about three years ago, if we can do this on land, can we do it on the oceans? And we said we could, but it's a tricky problem. But we decided to do it. And so we started a new effort to have a marine observatory network around the world, which one day will be as robust as the forest one. After all, that's 70% of the Earth's surface. We'll concentrate on our sites first, but we have partners lined up already. So let's go to the next line. A friend of mine, Michael Tannenbaum, a Georgia Tech alum who's done well in California, gave us a significant endowment to support this program. So we're starting with Smithsonian sites. The first one will be at Caribou Key, a tiny little spot of land off the coast of Belize, surrounded by magnificent reefs 
that are under stress, as well as the mangrove swamps, which would be a great loss if they went. So we're studying the reefs using biogenomics. And so this will not be a physical measurement process, but it will be a biogenomics process to watch the change in biogenomics profile of these sites around the world to help people understand climate change and other factors. Uh, I, I, had a, you know, I get to have some fun in this job. So. <laughs> and this is a lot of fun too. The Smithsonian has lots of students and I would invite any of you to think about doing an internship or a postdoc at the Smithsonian. Many of the, stu many of the people in that picture are our postdocs working with our faculty, if you will. And we're having a great time, so it was a good thing. But this is an important new endeavor for the Smithsonian. Next slide. I mentioned coral. This is Mary Haggardorn. She's a genius who works in Hawaii for the Smithsonian, looking at the reefs there, which are under stress. And she's come up with a way to save re reproductive tissue when they bloom. And they bloom at certain times of the year. And she can cryogenically store these so she can reimplant them in safe places so they can grow and be saved for the future. The species can be saved for the future. And they can be saved for hundreds of thousands of years, as far as we know. And she's the genius behind that. We're doing that actually with lots and lots of species, the 17,000 species today, but coral is one of those. Next slide. People are affected by climate change. The Smithsonian have anthropologists, and we've been studying people in the Arctic for probably 150 years. And I had a great opportunity as we were opening a new wing of the uh, American, uh, History, American Indian Museum in uh, Anchorage to visit with the Yupik people who live on this island, St. Lawrence Island in the Bering Strait, and sit with the elders and talk to them about climate change. They know it because they live it, and they are petrified by what they see in the changes. They are subsistence hunters. Let's go to the next slide. They go to sea still in these ships. The only change is they have an outboard motor when they go out. But they can't reach the hunting grounds anymore because the ice is too far away. The tundra, the permafrost on their island is melting. And feces are avoiding the island now. And so you have cultures, entire cultures, that are at risk and they see climate change on a daily basis. So it's happening there. Next slide. Birds, we have the uh, Migratory Bird Center at the National Zoo. We just issued this report just a few weeks ago. The Audubon Society issued a report 30% of the migratory birds in the country, in the world, are at risk. And a lot of changes that are occurring because of climate, because things are blooming at different times in different places, and they're moving around. And you think, well, that's sad for the poor birds, but it's not. It's sad for us. Because birds help forest diversity. They eat the seeds, and they drop the seeds. And when they drop the seeds, it helps forest diversity. If they move away from your forest, your forest will decline in diversity and will eventually die. Same thing is happening with pollinators. So we're seeing it in birds. Next slide. We have huge collections at the Smithsonian, 138 million objects, 127 million are scientific specimens. Many look like this. And look, they're stored in these kind of racks. That's Jeremy Jacobs, who's a, an amazing person who's taken care of mammals and reptile and amphibian collections for 40 years at the Smithsonian. What Jeremy is telling me here is an interesting thing. These are salamanders from my home state of Georgia. Because the Smithsonian collected them 100 years ago, we can compare to what they look like today. And what salamander uh, experts are seeing today is they're all getting much smaller. And they suspect it's due to climate change. They haven't decided yet. But climate change is clearly having an impact on another element in the natural environment. Next slide. Last one of these. So that's a new Leeds Platinum building that we built out of our Environmental Research Center, which really focuses on invasive species, marine species. They have a lab right here up in, uh, in uh, Tiburon. Because San Francisco Bay is the most invaded body of water by other species in any in the world because all the ships have dropped ballast out here. And the creatures have been left and have grown and invaded the bay. Many cases, invasive species are more successful in climate change periods than the native species. So what you're seeing is all the species are beginning to change in the bay and in many other bodies of water. So the bottom line here is that what we're seeing is winners and losers. We're seeing indications in every part of the natural system that changes are occurring. And that the changes are occurring more rapidly. You would think in 50 years you wouldn't see it, but we're seeing it, than we ever thought they were occurring. And that when climate change occurs, it occurs in pulses. It doesn't occur as a linear feature. 
So that's a little bit of an insight into the science of this, and the sci at least from the Smithsonian point of view. Let's go to the next slide. So that takes us to this idea. Welcome to the Anthropocene, which is the age of humans. Geologists haven't quite settled on this yet. It's still a new term. We're still in the Holocene, according to most. But the fact is, humans are leaving markers in the Earth that will be here for 500 million years. All those atomic tests have less plutonium in the ground. All those plastics that we invented in 1925 are now embedded in the ground. Carbon black is in the ground. It will never go away. So humans are leaving a permanent marker, so we live in the Anthropocene. So that brings us to engineering. This is the National Academy of Engineering study on climate change. It was done about two years ago. It's a fantastic study, four volumes. The last volume is called Adaptation. It talks about causes, it's talked about what we could do about it, but it last says adaptation. Because the chances are that we as engineers are not gonna get everybody to jump up and say, I will defend this particular body of water, or whatever it is we're going to deal with, to the very end. Instead, we're gonna get them to move in small pieces, small increments, so we're gonna have to adapt. So we have, as engineers, that's the way we, we work. Let's go to the next slide. Let's see where we are, just to get a frame of reference, all right? So this is 60 million years ago. This is atmospheric carbon. This is 2,000 up here. This was the pedum that we talked about. This is up maybe 1,500 parts per million. And we're down here. We're down here, which looks pretty good, until you look at the next slide. This is where people are projecting we're gonna go. We're, we're up here right now, close to 400. The experts, who I think are, are on target, say this is one emission scenario, depending upon how much work we do to fight it. And if we don't do much, this is another one. That's 900 parts per million by the end of the century. So what you're talking about is a very rapid rise in carbon. And the next question you ask yourself is, is it a, how does that compare to the rise in the pedum? And the answer is, this is faster. We're talking about time to adapt, but we're putting ourselves under pressure because carbon is increasing faster than it rose in that period that we call the Paleo-Eocene Thermal Maximum. Next slide. Okay, temperature. This is a lovely one I, because everybody can argue about this one. Those people that don't think climate change is occurring can say, hey, you're way down here now. Used to be way up here 55 million years ago. This is, this is the baseline zero there. But let's look at the next slide. Temperatures are going up. They have been going up since about 1910. It's a lagging factor. That's one of the reasons it can be brought into contest, uh, could be contested. And it goes up and down. So as soon as somebody says there's warming, somebody say, no, it went down. But the trend is up. The trend is up. Something we should think about. Next slide. Sea level rise. Well, 20,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, we we're at a glacial maximum. Sea level was 400 feet down from where it is today. 400 feet down from where it is today. It got up pretty high and then leveled off pretty well. So why should we be concerned about sea level? Next slide. Because sea level is increasing at a rate like that, from 1800 to now, it's increased about 10 inches. Not, nothing like 400 feet, but 10 inches, 10 inches since 1800. Now why is that important to us since 1800? And you have to think about human population. In 1800, there were one, one, one million people living on the earth. One million homo sapiens. Today, it's not billion, sorry. Today, there's seven billion. So we went up by six billion over that period of time. Where did all those people put down roots? Like you did, near the coast. So we now have six billion people added to our planet when this is happening next to the water, putting themselves at some risk because that's where things happen, right? So you have to think of those things together when you're thinking about an engineering source. Okay, next slide. All right, where's the rest of the water might come from? Most of that increase, incidentally, is because of warming and expansion of the water. It's not that more water's been put in the ocean. It's just warming. So where will more water come from? The first place would be the Greenland ice sheet. And it's starting to melt. And if it melts completely, you'll have 25 more feet of sea level rise. After that, it's up to where I'm standing, Antarctica. That's the South Pole. Ground elevation where I'm standing is 500 feet. But I'm standing at an elevation of 9,500 feet because there's 9,000 feet of ice under me. So there's 200 to 25 to 250 feet of sea level rise in Antarctica. And when it starts to go, 
then you really can see sea level go up much faster. So there's plenty of reserve power there to increase the sea levels. The question is, are we going to make it happen? Next slide. Are we already seeing effects of this rather modest increase in sea level? And the answer is yes. On the East Coast, Norfolk, home to the largest naval base in the United States, is being constantly flooded by tides. It was never before. The interesting thing is I always thought with the ocean, it would always be, if it's, if it's nine inches, it's nine inches everywhere. It's not. In, in Norfolk, it's a, it's, it's a foot and a half because they have prevailing currents there that cause it to go higher in Norfolk than other places. So this is a Chrysler Museum, which is now threatened by flooding, a beautiful museum. They constantly have problems with their underpasses, and the naval base is having problems. So it's happening, and it's happening in Miami and other cities as well. Next slide. Question is, in Washington, D.C., where I work, what's going on there? Suppose we had 10 feet of sea level rise. Maybe take 2200 as a time when it might occur. It could occur earlier, you don't know. The first thing you'd see is, here's the Smithsonian Museums on the Mall, is that you want to see your favorite museum? Get in a boat. <laughs> because this is all low-lying ground. And it's going to be impacted, and it already is, as I'll show you, by sea level increase. Next slide. 25 feet, if Greenland goes, you want to visit the Jefferson Memorial? Mr. Jefferson's going to be getting his toes wet by then. And that's what it looks like with 25 feet of sea level rise. Next slide. So what's the city of Washington, what's the Washington, D.C. doing about it and the federal government doing about it? The Corps of Engineers are taking action. And they have a small levee here, and I'm going to have to blow this up for you by talking because I can't do it otherwise. This is an existing levee here in Washington on the low point of some of the water, uh, ground there. This is the tidal basin where the Jefferson Memorial is. This is 17th Street, which goes up by the White House. Okay? So what they're doing is they're building a seawall over 17th Street. And the reason is that's one of the low points where water will come in, and then it will go in different places from there. So here's what the seawall will look like. It will look like this, you know, it'll, it, and it's designed for a one in a hundred year event. One in a hundred years, which means there's probably a 90% probability in 75 years it'll be over top. That's what that means. But that's a FEMA designation for us, okay? And so it's being built right now. That's the protection we're getting at this point in time. This is adaptation. Next slide. Why are we concerned at the Smithsonian? Here's the Tidal Basin, here's 17th Street, and here's Constitution Avenue. This is the lowest point in Washington, a museum mile. So when that water comes down 17th Street, it doesn't go to the White House, it comes down this way. And we've had multiple excursions of water down Constitution Avenue in the last 10 years. And we solve it right now with sandbags. We have some of the world's most unusual and important artifacts in those museums and they're at risk. This is the new museum, African American History and Culture, which will be completed in 2016, and we're designing it for that one in a hundred year event because we can't afford anything else. But we are working on that. We're recognizing it's a problem. But it's a real problem, and it's a real problem affecting real institutions. Next slide. Now, we've just been talking about the easy stuff. What about storm surge? Storm surge is a big and dynamic issue. We all know about Hurricane Katrina. As I said, I was fortunate to serve on that group and we had a great group that worked with me on that. Uh, and we wrote this report. Uh, most of our recommendations were followed, but not all. FEMA stepped in again and said, design the levees for one in a hundred year flood. We designed dams for one in 500, but levees one in 100. Why? I don't know. We do. This was Katrina, big mega storm. Next slide. Katrina, the uh, size of hurricanes is not all that important, it turns out. It's the track. And Katrina took the worst track possible for New Orleans. So here it comes churning up the, the, the Caribbean, and it turns a turn here. New Orleans is over here. What you want to notice here, of course, is that hurricanes turn this way, counterclockwise. So as this thing churns up, it's pushing water ahead of it, up, 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 and then down behind it. Next slide. So what happened in Katrina? This is Lake Bourne on the eastern side of New Orleans. Big Katrina coming up this way and it turns, it pushed the water, 20-foot storm surge, and it crashed into these levees which were poorly designed and they collapsed. As it pushed further up, the big circulation came this way and it pushed water across Lake Pontchartrain into the canals that ran down in the city and those levees collapsed. Now there are many reasons, I don't know Ray Seed and others have studied that as to why that happened, but they were poorly designed, just take it from me. 
But the fact of the matter is these surges really overwhelmed the existing system, just overwhelmed it. Next slide. So 2,000 people died. They didn't have to die. New Orleans is not ever going to be as big as it ever was before, but they have built a hurricane protection system for the city. Next slide. And here it is. It's a very modern system. It, it, it includes redundancy, resiliency in it, so it, it, if it gets overtopped, it'll still be able to handle uh, some of the conditions it couldn't handle before. But it's going to be overtopped because it's one in a hundred years. So what you have to figure out if you live in New Orleans is keep those evacuation plans, dust it off, because you're going to get overtopped and you're going to have water in New Orleans as a result of that. That's the one in a hundred year philosophy. Next slide. Superstorm Sandy, that was a wake-up call for everybody. Everybody sort of looked at New Orleans and said, oh, there are a bunch of weird people live down there in the values. <laughs> and that's not us. We would never do that. We live in New York City. And Hurricane Sandy, incidentally, was only a Category 2. Wasn't that big in that sense, but it was very big, broad. And it brought a huge storm surge, and it destroyed the coast of New Jersey. And it flooded the battery part of New Orleans. The financial district of the world, Wall Street, went blank for weeks on end, and it flooded the subway system. Amazing, because that battery park is down there where you, you get off and you, you catch the Staten Island Ferry. Why is that important to the Smithsonian? Next slide. We have a museum down there, National Museum of the American Indian in New York City, very nice small museum. It's in Battery Park, and that's what it looked like. The first floor of our museum <coughs> flooded. We got all the artifacts to the second floor, and we barely were able to keep the humidity control to keep them from being destroyed. So surge and, and sea level increase are very real. They're very real problems. And they're going to get worse. They're going to get worse. Next slide. So New York City is doing what New Orleans did. It's building its own flood control or protection system. And it's going to cost, they estimate at this point, $20 billion. It'll be more. And we're going to help pay for it. We're going to help pay for it. But if Hurricane Sandy had come into Washington, D.C., it would have destroyed Washington, D.C. If it had come into Savannah, it would have destroyed Savannah. If it had gotten near Philadelphia, it would probably have destroyed Philadelphia. So the point is the whole East Coast is subject to this problem. We're going to be spending billions and billions of dollars. And we have to make a decision. How much resilience do we build into the system to respect climate change as engineers? And we have to be able to talk cogently about this to people so they understand it. Next slide. The Smithsonian, we tried to increase the dialogue, working with the State Department. Secretary Kerry came for the Oceans Conference that we held, and it's very successful. More and more people are willing to talk about it. Dialogue is important, and next slide. Today, as we speak, we have our conference called Living in the Anthropocene, Prospects for Climate, Economics, Healthy State, and Security. And we have speakers from the Coast Guard, from the Department of the Navy, Department of Agriculture, from uh, EPA, and other uh, parts of the government system as well as in private sector because everybody's interested in this topic today. And Tom Friedman's there and he's going to talk about, probably talking right now as we speak, about how climate change is affecting the Middle East and, and the dynamics between countries there. And it is. Next slide. And that's the last slide actually. So let me conclude by saying uh, climate change is a topic we should all be aware of. We should be well informed about. We should take the big picture about it, my personal opinion, for engineers. Because if we take a narrow picture, we will never win the argument. We have to say that there are many indicators that climate change is occurring. Not one, not temperature or something of that sort. And we have to decide ourselves, you know, where is our position? How much will we argue that people should protect themselves against this growing issue? How much will we protect ourselves against that? And if we cannot make the argument and win the argument, to protect ourselves for 100 years, we have to say these are the consequences of not doing that. So I think it's an important subject for dialogue about engineers because this is coming. And it's going to be a major issue in the future for us, both on the west and the east coast. In the middle of the country where they're suffering, you're suffering droughts too. That's the other side of this coin as well. Winners and losers, winners and losers, and it's happening. So I hope uh, you gained a little bit of insight on, at least I did in my journey. Uh, and, and seeing a little bit about what I have tried to do to understand the issues myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Clough. Um, that was fascinating, sobering, but fascinating. Um, people will be pleased to know that Dr. Clough has agreed to answer questions, and because oh, oh, sorry. okay. <laughs> And be, because, because we're a university, and also because our students are the ones who are going to have to live longest with the impact of what you've just talked about, um, we will be prioritizing questions that come from students to ensure that everybody um, has a chance to hear the question as well as the response. Um, th if those of you who have questions could raise your hand, um, one of our staff will come with a microphone. Um, we're also recording this, so um, we want the audience to understand uh, what the questions were. So there's one over here. Hello, Dr. Kov. Um, I'd like to thank you, first off, for um, speaking today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, my question is, you talked about the adaptations that um, like the human species really have to make. Do you think that changing like the infrastructure of our cities is really going to, in the long run, um, kind of fix these changes that will happen with the sea levels rising? Or would it be like more possible, I know it would be crazy regarding economics and whatnot, but to completely create a new grid like inland. <laughs> um, well, just what are your views? Yeah, sure, it's a good question. I, I don't think, I think the answer is the sticker shock is so big for some of these things when you start thinking 200 years that it, it's possible for us to think about it. And we're not even supporting our present infrastructure, uh, much less to invest in these new endeavors. So I, I think what you have to do is to think about, uh, you know, again, it's like it in, in, in a way in New Orleans, it's to say, okay, we'll put up this much, but the rest of it will have an evacuation plan. So you cannot protect against a 200 year. The odd thing about New Orleans is that that one in 100 doesn't include Katrina. Katrina, nominally, based on the present database, is one in 300. Now that may change in time as we get more information on mega storms. But uh, I don't think, well, the other problem we have right now is we don't quite know enough about this. You know, it, it's still hard to say exactly how it's going to play out. When you tell someone sea level may rise two and a half or eight feet, that's a pretty wide range. And so it's hard to convince someone to, to protect for eight feet when they think they might get away with two and a half. And we really, it's hard to make the case. Uh, you could, but it's hard. So I think just realistically speaking and given the way budgets are today, that we have to work with people and get them to understand, okay, if we do this, there's still a real risk that this could happen. And you have to have a plan. And it, it could be an evacuation plan, it could be some other plan to deal with that, but you need to be prepared for that. Hi, Dr. Clough. Oh. Obviously, there's a big problem in climate change with the issue of stakeholders, and those that might be most affected are also in the developing countries. So I was wondering if you could comment how we as engineers can play a role in advancing the development of some of these economies while also being mindful of the effects that climate change are having. And also, what's the good word? <laughs> to hell with Georgia. Who got a Georgia Tech graduate? <laughs> okay, developing countries, obviously some of them are a great pearl. The Maldives are already, all, almost underwater today. Bangladesh is very much at risk and already losing ground against this fight. Uh, I think that it's part of our obligation. You have, a, I think, a center that really focuses on the developing world, which I applaud you for, because it's not, not enough for us to be, you know, Fortress America and protect ourselves. Uh, we're a part of the world and, and we want to be a player in the world. And so we have to share our knowledge with, with the rest of the world. So I think we have to help them in any way we can. It'll be tough because they have money problems as well. Uh, but there's, it's, 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 a, it's a pervasive problem around the world. I was in Peru, we're doing a, a wonderful exhibition on the Inca Road, which is gonna have a lot of engineering in it next year. And I didn't realize how dependent the Peruvians are on glacial, uh, on the glaciers in, in the Andes. And those are shrinking. And when those shrink and shrink away, they're gonna have serious water problems. So it, every country is gonna face this in, in one fashion or another. Yes. Hi, uh, thank, you, thank you for your talk. Um, to what extent uh, do we have any, any ability to mitigate or, or in some way affect the trends that we saw. Uh, uh, a lot of evidence, um, it, it, it seems to be that, that there's a lot of evidence that we had at least some agency through our activities uh, in those trends. So it seems that we could do something to slow them down or mitigate them. Or What can we do besides, of 
obviously protecting ourselves from the stuff that is already happening. Sure, that's a very good point. That's an excellent point. Because we are doing some things, and uh, just a question, uh, again, it's the interesting thing that comes out of this sort of dialogue is, it's the right question, right? It's the right at how fast carbon's going in the air and how fast we can respond to it. So there's no question using alternative fuels, using you know, en uh, energy sources. I, the lab that I showed you was a Leeds Platinum Lab. It has geothermal wells. It has 300 wells that go down in the ground, and it has solar cells. So we're trying to create a zero carbon footprint for our new buildings. Certainly, uh, automobile manufacturers, in many cases, we're getting with the program there because you're getting electric cars and hybrid cars and so forth. So anything we can do, uh, wind power. I think the other question will be nuclear power. Will that become more in, uh, relevant to us? Because it's certainly a low carbon footprint, no zero carbon footprint, and we have to do that safely. But I think there are questions that arise. The problem, the other thing we have is that wind power and things of that sort are local because our grid system's so bad, you can't transmit electricity across it because you lose most of it. So we have to learn a lot more. We have to really improve our battery technology so you can store that kind of power. There's a whole range of things that engineers have a big role to play in to help us mitigate this. So we could slow it down, and we might counter some of the worst effects. Very good point. Hi, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more to how the Department of Defense is addressing climate change. Um, you had mentioned that that's a growing concern, and I know that as a department of the country that has a very large budget and has a lot of its own infrastructure, um, where some of their research and focus is The Department is going. of what? Of Defense. Department of Defense, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm not, not an expert on defense. I, I'm not, I, I know about as much about it as you do. I know it's a big budget. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the good news is the Defense Department is worried about climate change because if the sea ice melts in the Arctic, which is fairly easy to do relative to these ice sheets, it's going to change the dynamic for our defense massively because Russia is going to have one of the largest shorelines next across from ours of any neighbor that we have, uh, and they're going to have huge access to natural resources that they, they don't have today, and so it changes our defense posture, and some of our ports which are where we berth our biggest ships, are going to have serious issues associated with climate change and sea level rise. So I think it's a good thing the Defense Department's worrying about climate change because people on the Hill and other places pay more attention to people with that kind of background who say, this is a serious problem, as opposed to just an academic saying it's potentially potentially serious problem. So I think the Defense Department now is worried about it, uh, the Coast Guard, especially the Navy, and that's a good thing. Uh, you mentioned oysters, but I hear that um, um, if we don't do something really quick, we're going to lose 20% of human protein from ocean acidification. Uh, so yep. is anybody looking at the engineering of, you know, trying to stop that process? Oh, now say that again. So uh, st uh, <coughs> is anyone looking into the engineering required to stop Acidification. Ocean acidification. Yeah, I think it's such a pervasive issue, you really can't stop it. I think it goes back to the question the young man asked here. If we can develop alternative sources that don't use carbon-based fuel, incidentally, it's not all carbon-based fuel. We realize in 1800, we started burning forests down all over the world. And that's, that's also put a tremendous amount of carbon in the air. Uh, the, the problem we have with ocean acidification is it's pervasive all over the world. And there's not really anything you can do about it uh, in any locality that will stop it. It's one of these things that you need global agreement that you have to address the issues. And the sad thing is reefs are very much, you know, people forget coral reefs are animals, and corals are very sensitive to pH and very sensitive to temperature. And so we are at risk at losing a significant, we already lost a lot of our corals to pollution and, and to the warming that's taken place so far. But we stand a chance to lose a lot more of our reefs in addition to our shell, shell, shellfish. So it's, it's a big problem. afternoon. Thank um, you. And as I say, it's sobering, but um, I hope that um, the audience is inspired to really realize how much en engineers can contribute to alleviating some of these um, yeah. very sobering um, realities that we're facing. Yeah, thank you very um, much. By way of a memento of your lecture, we have a certificate for you, um, mm -hmm. just thanking you for, um, on the occasion. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate Please it. Please join me one more time. In Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to um, one more time thank our ASCE students, um, the co-sponsors of this event for their hard work and co-sponsorship. And once again, thank our friends um, Warren and Marjorie Minna for their um, financial underwriting of this event. Um, it, this certainly brings home to me our pref professional responsibility as engineers to act um, in a way that is going to benefit humanity. So on that, it's my pleasure to invite everybody to retire to the um, Garbarini Lounge, which is just outside, so it's very easy to find, where we have a reception. And this, of course, will afford everybody the opportunity to um, talk among yourselves about the event and also um, hopefully catch um, some time with um, Dr. Clough to ask him further questions. So thank you.